Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Book Talk in uh, Connecticut's Old State House. This is a series where we highlight some books and authors focused on civics and government, because what is a democracy without some books? Today, we are joined by authors uh, Ed Goes, a Republican pollster, and Celinda Blake, a Democrat pollster, who are here to talk to us about their book, A Question of Respect, Bringing Us Together in a Deeply Divided Nation. This book was published in 2022 by Morgan James Publishing, and it makes a compelling case for how the nation has reached this moment of deep political division, where it needs to go and what it will take to get us there. So Linda and Ed have been working together for many, many years on their award-winning battleground poll, which is a national bipartisan survey that measures the political opinion among registered voters in the United States. So they have a lot of wealth of information on what's really going on in the minds of voters across the political spectrum, all across the country, and also what it takes to put our differences aside, communicate uh, constructively, and get the job done in our government and our society. So we're going to have a really good discussion with uh, Celinda and Ed. If anybody has any questions throughout the program, please uh, do make sure to put them in the chat. Or if you're watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube, make sure to put them on the comment section. Uh, I apologize for the strange uh, shadows on my face, but uh, let's, uh, let us begin with this uh, program. So let me first introduce our speakers. So Celinda Lake is one of the, De uh, the Democratic Party's leading political strategists. She was one of two lead pollsters for the Biden campaign in 2020 and continues to serve as a pollster for the Democratic National Committee, other national party committees, and dozens of Democratic incumbents and challengers at all levels of the electoral process. Uh, Celinda and her firm, Lake Research Partners, are known for cutting edge research on issues including the economy, healthcare, environment, and education, and have worked for a number of institutions, including the DNC, the Democratic Attorneys General Association, Human Rights Campaign, Planned Parenthood, and many, many others. Her international works uh, has included projects in Liberia, Belarus, Ukraine, South Africa, and Central America. So Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, and also Ed is here with us. Ed is on a mission to bring respect and civility back to America. A leading political strategist with over three decades, Goes has uh, led one of the most respected and successful Republican survey research and strategy, uh, strategy teams in American politics. His award-winning terrorist group serves as strategic advisors for hundreds of GOP governors, U.S. senators, congressmen, and political organizations. In addition to his campaign work, Ed partners with Celinda on the celebrated national, nationally recognized Georgetown University Institute of Politics and, Sur uh, and Public Service Battleground Poll, which is what I mentioned earlier, which has been a leader in bipartisan uh, public polling since 1991. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today with us. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. All right. So why don't we go ahead and start with the questions again? If anybody has any questions during our, our discussion, please do make sure to leave them in the chat and we will get to them at the very end. We will have a short Q&A session. OK, so Linda and Ed. So I want to start off a little bit with uh, some background on the book itself. So why don't we go over why uh, you decided to write about uh, this topic? How did the idea for this book come about and how did you write a book uh, between the both of you? You want to start off, Celinda? <laughs> well, Ed really deserves the credit. Um, this was his concept. Um, and I'll, I'll take one other step backward uh, just to talk a little bit about our experience together that was formative in the book. So uh, we have been working together, as, as you noted, since 1991. And we met uh, working on democracy in uh, Budapest in a um, uh, piano bar where of course all good things start and we came up with the notion that we really wanted to see there was lots of bipartisan polling but there was not very much bipartisan there was no polling that had a republican perspective and a democratic perspective on the same data and where people respectfully discussed how they saw the data how they looked at the data and that's how we started the battleground poll and did that poll for two or three times a year since 1991 and then changed uh, when we were at Georgetown into the civility poll to really um, monitor the polarization in America. I think really formative 
and important to this book was also not just our experience of working together and working together very respectfully, uh, but I was born and raised a Republican on a ranch in Montana, and Ed was born and raised a Democrat uh, from a military family in, that ended up in Oklahoma. And we both switched parties in the same year, 1972. Uh, so that brought us a real perspective of respect and, and friendships on the other side. Um, and looking, you know, we both came from cultures, ranching and the military where people work together toward common goals. And that was something that was always very, very important to us. And where we were taught as a fundamental value growing up, respect for someone as an American, respect for someone as a, um, as, as a human being. And so that was very foundational. We both have been really disturbed at both the cultural influences and the structural things that are promoting such horrible polarization. And of course, that was exemplified uh, by Donald Trump. And um, we both believe that Trump was really the symptom, not the cause of polarization. And so I'll turn it to Ed to um, talk about his thinking around this. I say that um, I want to acknowledge that it's easy for um, a Democrat to critique the Trump polarization. Ed has been a very early and very courageous Republican who stayed in the party but critiqued this level of polarization. I have deep admiration for that. It is not easy. So, Ed, let me turn it well, to you. Thank you, Celinda. And um, uh, probably the last point, the, the important thing there was I did stay within the party. I didn't go with many of the people that went to the Lincoln Project uh, from the outside uh, going after Trump. Um, uh, a lot of this was driven, quite frankly, from building off our relationship that Celine and I had developed over the years. We've not only become friends, we've become good friends um, uh, through the years. Uh, and I think always showed respect to each other all the way through. Um, and I think that led to it a great deal. I did a fellowship at Georgetown in 2018, halfway through the first four years of Donald Trump, and I did it on civility um, and because it was an issue I was very bothered with, uh, bothered coming out of the 2016 campaign, uh, presidential campaign, um, which we had two candidates, quite frankly, that were highly disliked. Their unfavorables were higher than their favorables, and it became kind of a contest on who was disliked more at the end as opposed to who had the most to say positive through the campaign. And my, my two sons who are now 18 and 14 were at that time six years younger. Um, and I, I didn't feel I wanted them to ever see me in any way endorsing the way Trump was and, and uh, spoke out on it very early. Uh, Trump didn't like me, I didn't like him, and I had no problem with that. Um, but when I finished the civility, uh, the fellowship at Georgetown, I came out of that very impressed with the young people I dealt with in college uh, then and um, wanting to write a book, but I didn't want it to be Trump centric because as Celinda said, I do believe he's part of this. He's a symptom, not the disease. Um, and I think in the book, we found just how deeply our country has fallen into what I often see as a death spiral of incivility that we have in this country. Um, and so when Trump lost uh, in 2020, um, within a couple of days, I called Celinda and asked her if she'd like to do the book with me. And we must have had two dozen emails going back and forth that day, plus some talking on the phone, and decided to move forward with it and spent the next two years writing the book. Um, uh, we, we did think Trump was gone. <laughs> it was funny on exactly two years after that day, I called her about doing the book, Trump announced he was going to run again. Um, so he kind of threw a little bit of a kink in the works on what we want to be out there talking about. Uh, but if nothing else, it's only supplied and fueled the interest in what we had to say and what we were talking about out there. All right, thank you so much. And 
all this talk about respect. I think that before we get into the meat of the book itself, we should go over some terminology, right? So for you, what does it mean to respect someone? Because uh, obviously it can't be that it has to be someone that you agree totally with, of course. Uh, but specifically, what does it mean to respect someone you disagree with or have difference of opinions with? Let, let me take that one for, first, Linda. Because um, one of the things we found was that all the institutions in this country are at an all-time low in terms of respect just for the institutions. And it's not just government. It's the media. It's healthcare, it is big business, it is unions. You, you pick a institution in this country and it's an all time low religion in, in many aspects. Um, I grew up, as Silla mentioned, I grew up what we call respectfully an army brat. Um, my father uh, was from Hawaii. My family goes back to Hawaii to the 1840s. And when he was young, a young teenager, he had served mass at church and was walking home and saw the smoke coming up from Pearl Harbor. And from that day on, all I ever wanted to do was go in the military. And I remember being on a ship uh, on our way to Germany for the first time in 1959, when the news came that Hawaii had been made a state. He knew it was coming. He had a flag hidden in the, in, in, in the suitcase and he took it out and we in the middle of the Atlantic sewed a star on the flag um, as a family. Um, he also had a cigar box. <laughs> um, being seven, I thought maybe it was candy or toy or something. I said, oh, your mom and I just plan on having more children. Um, not knowing the connection between cigars and having a baby. Uh, at least in those days. Um, and a year and a half later, my brother was born in Frankfurt and he showed up with that box under his arm and asked for the head nurse and said, in this box is dirt from America and you will put it under the mattress where my child is being born because I want my child to be born on American soil. And the importance of those stories is he taught me, um, and I think a lot was his uh, experiences through Hawaii, his experiences in the military, uh, the respect of becoming a state. Um, he taught me that you respect someone not because of the color of their skin or not because of their sexual preference or, or gender. He taught me you respect a person because they're an American and that every American deserves that respect on the surface and on the front end. Um, and I, I, in the book, when we tried to get into the whole respect issue, it was kind of hard because how do you tell someone to respect someone for being an American when respect for our country is at such a low? Um, but I still think it's getting back to that, kind of understanding that we are all in this together um, and uh, everyone has a right to their own opinion, but we also have a right to respectfully deal with each, each other to find solutions uh, that uh, that we need in this country to move forward. So let them. I think Ed said a lot of it. Um, I think that uh, respect includes um, assuming that you are gonna find common ground and have common goals. One of the things that was really important in writing the book was we, out of this heritage of the battleground survey where we had had two different opinions about uh, or two different analyses about the same data, we decided to write uh, the problems in a common voice because we, we agreed on the problems. And then we had different solutions. And um, we wrote about each of our solutions in our own voices. And that was one of the ways in which we showed respect and listening and equal inclusion of both sides, um, but also listening and, and coming to agreement about the problems. And I think that's part of the model. I rely in the book, um, a similar story from my childhood, growing up on a ranch. Um, I remember my dad saying one day at the breakfast table, well, we're going to, you know, we're all going to work together today and we're going to go over and mend fences with our neighbors, Mr. Miles. And a little kid squeak, know it all me. I said, well, I thought we didn't like Mr. Miles. And my dad said, well, first of all, don't ever say that. And that's not true. And secondly, um, 
it doesn't matter whether we like each other or not. We have a common fence line. We got to repair that together. We got to work together. And that is very much of that individualism, but still working together in, in times to get things done in times of crisis. That is very much a part of rural America's tradition. And it was something that was profoundly important to me in the way that I was raised. Thank you so much, both of you. I apologize for the change in scenery, but I'm trying to work with the, the, the sunlight <laughs> coming down. Okay, so while reading your book, it really reminded me of, you know, sort of like a diagnostic doctor looking for the symptoms and explaining why and explaining how. And uh, one of the first things that you touch upon in your book is uh, how the political system as it's set up and also the media, how it incentivizes this negativity and this aggressiveness in uh, politics. And it actually seems to discourage people being respectful and showing civility towards your political opponents. Can you speak a little bit towards that? Yes, I think um, both of us agreed. And, and it was fun. Um, and this, again, was his idea. After we finished the book, we actually taught a course. He, he had started the book with a course, and we ended the book by teaching a course. And um, a really, really smart um, juniors and seniors at, at Georgetown and um, we all agreed that one of the worst things that's happening in terms of polarization, division, lack of respect is social media. And of course, it was great to talk that through with a generation for whom social media is their number one language. And we had several people who are quite sophisticated in the media and the approach. We had people from some different countries, which was also gave us some insight because those countries, one of them being Australia, could have different regulations. But there is no question that the anonymity, the misinformation, disinformation, we make a distinction between the two, the um, uh, kind of um, the algorithms all promote polarization, promote having information only from your side, promote using language that people would not tend to use in person and or not tend to use if they thought their mothers or their kids were going to see it. And so social media is a big, big um, piece. We also talk about uh, structural issues, um, including gerrymandering, the primary structure, which I'll let Ed speak to, money in politics, and we have different solutions, but we both agree that the money in politics and the independent expenditures in particular promote polarization because it's the lucky candidate now who controls 25% of their message. And they're seeing things put up on their behalf by independent expenditures that they would never agree to put up with themse themselves. And there are no controls of the friends, the family, what do I want my kids to see? Who am I? Um, and, you know, when we work for candidates on both of us, uh, have worked for candidates who say, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to say that. That's just not who I am. That's not how... I want to present my candidacy. We also talk about cable news and the change. There is no fairness policy anymore. Cable news has followed social media in terms of polarization. And that it's very hard for people to get accurate information. It's very hard for people to get information on both sides of an issue, calmly presented, not emotionally presented. And so there are just a number of structural as well as cultural features that have promoted polarization. And I'll turn it to Ed to bring up some of the other ones we discussed. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna leave for the, the primary problem uh, for a little bit later. I think uh, the, the root of what, what I see um, out there, and it's been, you know, one of the things that, and I just retired from the firm at the end of, uh, end of the year last year, um, after 40 years uh, with the firm, but we had a policy very early on when we when we put the firm together. We had been working for the party. We had to work for everyone that ever got the nomination because we were working for the party, not working directly with the candidates. Um, and we developed a policy that we were going to approach every interview with a candidate um, as a two-way interview. Um, they needed to see if they wanted us involved in their campaign, and we wanted to see if they were quite frankly, the type of person we want to be spending our time with and working for. And while I didn't see the benefit of it necessarily at the beginning, through the years, we work with so many good people. 
uh, and didn't work with a lot of people that maybe we would have been chasing if we didn't have that two-way interview uh, process. Uh, that was very positive. But one of my frustrations over the years is teaching, uh, teaching so many of these elected officials problem solving, basic problem solving. And basic problem solving goes through four stages. You talk about the problem, you talk about the solution, you implement solutions, and that creates a new set of problems. There's always unintended consequences from your solutions. And so you start the cycle over again. And I think, unfortunately, we've gone through that cycle so many times that we're not finding solutions that are truly addressing the everyday voters. Um, it's why the, the feelings of the institutions are so low, because it's not just government that's not meeting those solutions. It can be very often religion, big business, you pick it, uh, the media. Um, but the problem with that lack of solutions is the voters have become very cynical to everything around them. And the problem with cynical voters is that cynicism tends to have this strange hook that people start listening to demagoguery much closer uh, that maybe is preaching a change to them, whether it's coming or not. And um, part of the problem is the media, part of the problem is super PACs, part of the problem is social media, um, all of which have increasingly used demagoguery to pull people in and to reinforce through algorithms uh, the message that is getting them excited. Um, and that is largely responsible for what's, what's driving the mood out there. Um, Americans are no longer looking at each other um, as partners in this. They're looking at each other for competition to get their problem solved when they think other people are getting that attention instead. Thank you so much. And so, um... In your battleground poll, you found that Americans, or most Americans, I should say, are, are weary about this, uh, this constant uh, on-edge feeling, this constant you, us versus them uh, sentiment that's just permeating everything, it seems. So, but at the same time, it, you also found that voters seem to respond more positively to negative messaging in, in uh, campaigns and such that they... They, they seem to respond more to candidates that act that way. So how, how do you explain this uh, contradiction and what, 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 where is it coming from, you think? Mm -hmm. So do you want to take? Oh, I was thinking, uh, well, uh, well, you should start with, because uh, you run positive campaigns. Right. Um, uh, a lot of it is, is that there is a lot of studies that say negative information sticks with people more. It, it, it has more kind of glue to it. And so I think often people for the shortcut go in that direction. Um, but something I'd like to think I was able to prove during my career, and I won way more than my share of campaigns over the years, is I always approached it from a standpoint of, number one, we have to be for something, not be against something. And number two, um, if you approach it and run a positive campaign and stick to that, you actually can win that campaign just as easily as using the negatives. And I think the problem is I, I used to hate it when the media people would say, well, we use negative because it works. My response to that was always try positive. It works too. And you ought to try it once in a while. And there's some very, very, um, uh, good officials today um, that are in the Senate and in the House, they got there with positive campaigns. And I think they're trying to govern in a positive way. Uh, the problem is, is that there's been too much clutter out there on the negatives um, and playing to cable news and playing to social media. Um, and I think there's some answers to it that we'll get at the end. Uh, certainly one of the things we did in the book that I think was good is that we knew that we wanted to talk about young people as part of the future because they are part of the future, uh, very definitely. Um, but we wrote about all the problems first before we got to that chapter of hope in young people.
because we want to see how big a wall we had built so that our solutions would not be Pollyannish and would make sense in terms of what you play out there. Um, but again, um, the negative continues to be pushed out there. Um, and I think one of the things I hope for is more and more of the campaigns will start holding the other side accountable for running a negative personal campaigns. One of the things that I used in the later years is when I went to a campaign to talk to them about working in the campaign, and the very first thing that they had done in the campaign is opposition research of the opponent, I turned around and walked out the door because they're not looking at what the candidate they're working for, what they have good that the voters need to hear, as opposed to what the opponent uh, is saying or is that is bad. One of the things I think too about um, negative campaigning and one of the things that is very problematic about it, and I have to say, I was initially very, very much for small donor contributions and um, that has turned out not to be a success story. Maybe there are ways to do it, like the Seattle voucher system, where it would work, but the way we've implemented it hasn't worked. You know, people on my side of the aisle will say things like, why did Marjorie Taylor Greene be so insulting to the president? And it's like, she made $1.7 million that night, $3 million total. Um, there is a real incentive structure for donors to respond to the negative, even though the voters don't like it. And you have to raise that money to put those ads up in our current structure. We both believe strongly that the current campaign finance system is a disaster in terms of this polarization. We have different solutions, uh, but that's clearly part of the problem as well. And then, you know, voters will say they don't like it, but they will often retain differences, but there are ways to present differences. I think, you know, we saw the abortion issue play out in the 2022 election. We've seen um, the uh, crime issue play out in 2023 elections. I think if there's a substantive difference between the candidates, you can present that clearly to the voters. Here's one person's view, here's another. You don't have to characterize them. You don't have to do dramatic ads with eerie music and stalking and all of that to make your point. You can present those issue differences. And the problem is the voters have absolutely nowhere to get that kind of information anymore. And campaigns, which spend literally billions of dollars total, don't provide very good information to the voters. Yeah, I guess you could also say that the negative goes viral faster and longer. <laughs> yeah, for the same. Mm -hmm. It's often yeah. the actors that are the problem, not the voters. Mm -hmm. True. So um, in the book, you go into detail about how this deep divide that feels like such a new thing, such a novel thing is really, it, it feels like it's worse than ever. But is it really? Does you, uh, or could it be that the way information works right now and the way that the media works right now makes it feel like it's worse than it's ever been before? What's, our, what's the history of polarization in the country? <laughs> it's an interesting question because uh, Carl Rove, I actually saw, I guess wrote a book, Ed, I'm not even sure if he wrote a book or was just giving a speech, but he gave a very interesting speech where he said, things are so bad, but let's remember that we had people shooting each other on the floor of Congress and beating each other up. So I think what's bad about it, though, is um, the two things that are so bad about it. We're in trouble, troubling times, and it's keeping us from being able to solve problems together. And the voters, rightly so, believe that any three vo voters in America can agree on more than Congress does and can get more done. And when we face a crisis, we do come up with a bipartisan compromise, uh, but that's very, very hard to obtain. Even frankly, with like him or not, Joe Biden is one of the pre presidents and you know most willing to work bipartisanly of anyone that we've had in a couple of elections. Um, secondly, I do think that the the um, campaign finance, the redistricting process the money process, the um, 
media environment, the social media environment, have really increased the polarization. So you cannot get away from it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's dominating the tone. It's increasing cynicism, as Ed pointed out. And I think it's uh, very, we have to turn it back. And we're going to have to take charge of it and turn it back. Well, I think I think part of the answer, you know, they always point to events that happen in history and say, well, this was just as bad when it happened. But the problem is, is the information flow is on steroids under the present system that through social media, through cable news, through super PACs and the algorithms they are using to just keep, you know, one, one of the things I did uh uh, for a couple of months after I retired is I started only watching the news once a week. And I found out that I wasn't missing anything. It basically was repeating on repeat and repeat and repeat of the same stories uh, that were out there. And it was like watching a soap opera once every so often. You can plug in and get the gist of everything that's there. But the, the biggest thing is the amplification through algorithms of negative information that is getting more eyeballs, but in getting more eyeballs, they're also uh, to some extent brainwashing uh, the voters on attitudes um, and especially negative attitudes because of the way that they're doing it in the process. And I think they need to be held accountable. Um, one of the points I made, and uh, Selena mentioned the disinformation, but one of the points I made on the book about Tucker Carlson is I had been actually a fan of his for years. I found him as a reporter. He was very well researched. He asked good questions. He was very balanced with a conservative tent. But when he went on the show and had his own show in the evening, he turned into a demagogue and not only turned into a demagogue, Oh, I know oh. Ed, uh, Ed has been having uh, problems with his Wi-Fi, but I'll finish yeah. the talk to him. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Turning into a demagogue, and in general, what we're finding is the incentive structure, even for reporters, oops, to, it has gotten oh, much, more, <laughs> uh, has gotten much more negative, um, and in fact, reporters, frankly are not even rewarded to say on cable news for uh, the number of um, viewers they have at the time. They're rewarded also in their incentive structure, whether they're brought back on, is whether or not they are um, they have social media followers. So it's, it's really taking the whole thing uh, to the, the most polarized extreme. Mm -hmm. Again, what goes viral? <laughs> Yeah, I hope Ed is able to rejoin us soon, but uh, if it's okay with you, let's uh, continue to the next question okay. because it seems that we have uh, uh, finished our diagnostics of uh, the, the problems and now we can start looking at some treatments and some possible solutions. Uh, so let's talk about how to bring the nation back together during this deeply uh, divided time. So why do you think that's something as simple as respect? You know, it's something that most of us should be learning in kindergarten, right? Uh, here's Ed back. Okay, no. Welcome back, Ed. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, just asking uh, Celinda our next question. Why do you believe that something as simple as respect um, uh, is... Uh, it's all three of can us. Be... Yes. Oh, can you hear us, Ed? On Tucker Carlson, is everyone was so fo on, on Tucker Carlson, everyone was so focused on the Murdoch story mm -hmm. that they missed the fact that he took something that he knowingly knew It, and that is disinformation. And that's something that remain in the business. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Uh, so you're cutting up a, uh, a little bit. I think we can, I hope you, 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 you can continue, but you're just a little bit uh, coming in and out. <laughs> okay. Well, let's continue to the next question. <laughs> uh, um, why do you believe that something as simple as uh, respect can be the foundation uh, for us to, to rebuild the unity in our country? 
Well, I think it, we both think it's a foundation, as you said, it's a foundational attitude and it, uh, and it um, influences how we treat each other. It influences how we see our institutions. It influences how we see the leaders in different um, specters of our country. And it was very, very much a foundational um, trait that both of us were taught uh, as young people. And um, it's interesting because it's challenging with younger people today. One of the most interesting findings uh, in our work when we thought, you know, we wrote it as the the future is um, the young people is that young people had a different attitude toward respect. They told us in the research that we were doing with them that I'm not going to give someone respect who denies my existence. I'm not going to give someone respect. They have to earn it. And our a fundamental belief is that it doesn't really work that way. You have to grant it from the get-go. Now, someone can lose it really fast. Donald Trump managed to lose both of our respect immediately. Uh, but um, you have to grant it. But we understand what young people were saying. And we think that one of the important things, there are two important things here, that we have to look at uh, who are some of the leaders out there, young and old, who are models of respect. And uh, one, one of the people we dedicated the book to, and Ed can speak to this uh, when he gets back on, is um, John McCain. And as Ed will often say, he saw the worst of humanity as a prisoner of war, uh, mistreated every year, had his arms broken every year, and still had deep, deep respect um, for people. And there was that seminal moment in the debate in Arizona where, uh, or the rally in Arizona, where a woman said, Barack Obama is a Muslim. And he took the Mac mic back from her and he said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, that's not true. He's not a Muslim. Uh, we disagree about a lot of issues, but I respect him and he is not a Muslim terrorist. Uh, and that was very important. And we also put in in the back of the book, his letter to America, and then uh, Joe Biden's eulogy of John McCain, because we feel like for all of us, we need models of respect uh, to show how you can be principled and still be respectful, how you can disagree and be respectful, how you can reach uh, common solutions, and how you can stand up for uh, what you feel is a fundamental moral issue and still be respectful to each other, still work together. There are some other structures in terms of how Congress operates that have really deteriorated the amount of respect that people show each other. When Ed and I both started in the business, um, Congress was in Washington longer. Newt Gingrich changed the rules and put Congress people back in their districts more, which was a uh, well-intentioned move, but it had the unintended consequences of families went back to the district. And so the day of you know, Ed being a coach of a baseball team that had Democrats and Republicans on it and both of them cheering their kids on the same team and him, he, Ed coaching both of their kids doesn't happen anymore. You don't have the spouses getting together to do the fundraiser for the victims of the hurricane in uh, Puerto Rico, which you and I were talking about before you, um, we started this seminar. And so People don't get to know each other. They don't have lunch together. They don't spend time with their families together. And that allows things to be much, much more polarized and for you to make people and treat people like caricatures rather than fellow human beings who may have the same, um, who will have the same goals and values, but um, may just come about that in a different way. And I don't know Thank if you want to talk about <laughs> also the youth institutes that you feel are pretty fundamental to change. Well, what one of the exciting, well, two things I would say. Um, one is on the book. We decided to go with a hybrid that didn't, not one of the major publishers that would take it and rewrite it over the next year. We wanted to come out, in, out after the election and made the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list in three weeks, not because we had a big publishing company behind us, but because people were interested in the subject. Um, and I'm seeing that all over the country. There are civility institutes popping up in universities in virtually every state. Um, we have spent 
a good part of the last six months going around and speaking at many of those um, and have others kind of coming and wanting us to come in. Um, I think there's a hunger out there um, for a different way. People just don't quite know how to get there. And I think the more all of us are talking about being in this together and how to get there with mutual respect, the more likely it is that we'll move in that direction. Um, and then we have to do some things to fix the political system. All right, thank you so much. And uh, you know, Selinda, hearkening back to what you were talking about, the young people, uh, how they, they say, oh, people have to earn our respect. We don't get to give it out just from the get-go. But, uh, you know, some people, especially young people, I would say, they feel like it's, uh, it's, it's, they, they feel like it's their moral obligation to stand up and, and, and fight people that they disagree with fundamentally. So uh, how, how can people fulfill that moral obligation that they feel while avoiding falling into the trap of being so uncivilized and negative and, and aggressive? I think there are a couple of answers to that. There are ways in which you fight um, and there are boundaries. And one of the things I find very often now and that voters find very distasteful is that um, the political discourse has a deteriorate so badly. You can stand up for principle and not engage in name calling. You can stand up for principle <coughs> and not um, give out negative information. You can stand up for principle and not attack people personally or attack their families and children. And, and frankly, uh, children and spouses used to be um, on both sides of the aisle when presidents had young children, they were off limits. And that has been observed somewhat now, but not completely. So um, I think that there are ways to fight, and, and we are a progressive firm. We fight very hard on principle, um, and we feel as strongly about it as anyone, and there are only certain clients with certain positions that we will take. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't respect candidates who don't have that position, that we can't, even on the most polarizing issue out there, that we can't seek uh, to find some common ground. Um, and, and look for things. And there may be points at which there just isn't agreement, but there are lots of points in between where there is, and issues are being made polarized that just aren't polar. Why is it polarizing whether you repair a bridge or not? Why is it polarizing where you, whether you, whether it's a Democratic or a Republican governor that you want to get one of the major bridges on a major east, north, Northwest, I mean, North South um, Highway repaired if a tanker accidentally runs into it and melts the bridge down. Um, those things, nobody wants uh, kids to be shot in school. Um, that's just horrific. And the teachers having to literally throw their body to protect the children. Nobody wants that. Uh, nobody wants someone to suffer from mental illness without any help. So it just seems to me that. Yes, there may be some things that we don't agree on. There may be some structures, but there's an awful lot at this point that we could agree on and uh, get moving and get done. You know, it's it's interesting. We asked a question in our surveys. Um, and we asked them separately. One was, uh, do you want your member of Congress to stand up for their values, even if it means they don't accomplish anything. And I think it was like 71% of the public said yes. We then asked the same group of people, do you want your member of Congress to compromise on their values in order to uh, find solutions that affect our everyday lives? And 74% said yes. When we did a forced choice though, when we gave them both and said, pick one, it was 68 to, to 30 compromise on the values to find solutions. And I think part of the problem when we get into a whole discussion of fighting for principles is who we're electing today. Because in 1990, uh, there's a group that does a scatter map of the ideology of Congress. And in 1990, that scatter map was evenly distributed left to right, right to left, and a little bit thicker in the middle. In 2020, 30 years later, that same ideological scatter map 
was at the two ends with, you could almost count the 16 or 17 dots in the middle. And when we looked into the problem behind it, the problem behind it is in 1990, about 35% of Republicans voted in Republican primaries and about 35% Democrat primaries. In 2022, it was 17% of 15% of Democrats in Democrat primaries. The people voting in primaries today because of what we've done in terms of the whole system um, is the the 30% that are voting in the two primaries that are saying, I want my member to go there and fight over values, not over finding solutions. Um, and, and so the people we're electing today, nom nominating today before we even get to the choice of selecting who's going to represent us, are being selected by the far right and the far left that think it's all about fighting over values. Well, values have two sides. Um, uh, John Meekham, who's written uh, some wonderful books on history, made a point recently that in the process of looking at history, and he's a great historian, we need to look at both the good things and the bad things, and not just focus on the bad things. And I think we've fallen into a trap increasingly that we're looking at the bad things that happen, rather, as he said, our job now, as we move forward as a democracy or a republic, we need to move forward and make sure that people that weren't included under that constitution in the early days are now included. But you don't do that by focusing on just the bad. You do that by focusing on the good and make sure it applies to everyone. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ed. And to that, I think I would add that also not for people not participating in primaries, also in local elections. Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, local elections are the ones that are going to affect your day to day life the most of all. And uh, you do have to participate in those. Those are the ones that are going to uh, affect you most of all in your day to day life. OK, so uh, let's see. Uh, in your book, you give many examples of times where you disagreed on something, but could still, you know, discuss the issue and openly and respectfully. Could you give us maybe an example on one of those times and maybe some advice on how others might be able to talk through their disagreements in order to come to a, you know, a constructive solutions to the issues? Well, the whole book is actually a model <laughs> of that. And this notion uh, that we came up with of uh, writing about the problems jointly and the solutions in each of our own voices and we didn't go back and forth like, you know, Ed didn't write about his solution, then I critique it right away. And I write about my solution, then Ed goes after it right away. No, we presented it as a set of ideas. Uh, here are the different things. Here we see is the pro and cons. Uh, we propose that some of these ideas might be combined together. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the very structure of the book is actually a recommendation for how to do that. And not being afraid that... Um, only your ideas can get out, not being, I mean, obviously we have a very, very deep friendship and uh, Ed often tells the story, he designed the front and uh, people uh, with our backs to each other, which some people interpret as we're facing off in the duel. And it was out of a military tradition that I found really heartwarming and that has certainly been expressed in our lives um, and our mutual uh, lives of We've always had each other's back. And there's no one who's been more supportive of me personally and in my career than Ed Goas. And I think that that is really, really uh, a powerful example. You can definitely disagree, uh, but nobody's got a monopoly on all the good ideas here. And maybe out of the discussion, the third best idea will come out. Or we can still make progress uh, even in a flawed system. And I would add to that the problem that I mentioned about problem solving, that we're not stopping in that third phase and asking a question, are we going to make things worse with our solution than the solution we're trying to, the, the problem we're trying to fix, unintended consequences uh, that come from it. So if you don't have that healthy discussion all the way through of talking about the problem, talking about solutions, coming up with solutions, 
and thinking through what are the unintended consequences of doing this. If you can't have that conversation all the way through, you're going to end up with some real problems, no matter what your solution is. Um, that discussion has to happen because there are good ideas and good input from both sides. And getting to that point that you're, uh, you're kind of working through all the inherent problems on a strict position on one side or the other uh, is extremely important. And, and respect is the only thing. And the thing I always say to people that ask me about respect and how can you respect someone on the other side is that respect goes both ways. Um, if you don't respect your opponent and you're in a campaign, you're going to underestimate that opponent. And that's the last thing you want to do as you're going through the race, because you underestimate your opponent and they're going to take advantage of that. So I think approaching it from the very beginning with respect is the right thing to do, whether you're looking for solutions or looking for a victory. Wonderful. All right. So in uh, terms of uh, a debates and, and discussions and, and conversation, how I've been wondering this, how do you keep yourselves from trying to, because, you know, most debates, one thinks that at the end of the day, a discussion is one person trying to convince someone else of something, uh -huh. right, to, to, turn, to change their mind. So how do you keep yourselves or do you keep yourselves from trying to convince each other just to see uh, issues and problems from each other's perspective. Oh, we try to convince each other. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think one of the things about being pollsters is our first job is listening. And so, um, you know, we, and, and our second job is asking questions. And so that, uh, that is, at least for me, that is a training that it's like, if I have a disagreement, it's like, well, I see it this way, and I know that Ed is going to listen to my point of view, and then I listen to his point of view, and why, and then I may introduce, well, I was thinking about it this way, why don't, why doesn't it seem that way to you? Um, I also feel like with, um, if you're a pollster, you're used to people disagreeing, you've seen the full panoply of ideas. You're used to also people holding mutually contradictory views. And as I often say to our candidates, they usually deeply resent having that pointed out to them. So I don't feel a great, we have a lot of tolerance for ambiguity and a lot of tolerance for differences in opinions because that's our day job, or at least for me, that's my day job. And I have a lot of interest in understanding well, how do people, our job as pollsters is how do people see things? Why do they have those views? What would it take to change those views? What are not changeable? Um, where did they, what kind of information was input into those decisions? So we, we have a certain skill set and a certain analytical approach that I think makes it a lot easier. And then we're not craving that we have to agree on every last thing together. But we respect each other's differences and we're very, um, you know, we're aware of them and don't try to raise them or cause conflict with the differences. We look for the common ground. Maybe we should all be posters. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anything to add, Ed? Uh, no, I mean, the only thing I would, uh, you know, I grew up again an army brat. I went to 15 schools in 12 years. Um, and I had a speech impediment. So um, I tended to be quiet and listen. I make up for it now. Um, but I found that to be very, very helpful as, as we went through. Um, also have, and I mentioned this in the book, you know, the, my father always kind of uh, pressed the, the uh, Portuguese heritage, but also the Hawaiian culture. And there's a thing in Hawaii called um, talk story, that when you meet someone for the first time, you share bits and pieces of your life, hoping that it will connect with bits and pieces of their life. And I think we've moved to a point in our public life that there's not that sharing of, of experiences to find common ground. Um, going to 15 different schools, we had to find friendships quickly and be open to being friends quickly. 
Um, I think that openness has been closed off with so many Americans today, and I think that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we're running a little bit short on time, so I think we can uh, wrap it up with one final question before we go super quickly over a couple of uh, questions from the audience. So some cynics might believe that we're, we're just too far gone. It's, it's the, the divide is way too deep, it's way too strong, uh, and there's, there's no going back, and maybe things will actually become worse before they become better. What would you say to someone who has this, this, uh, this opinion? Do you want to start it? No, I'm, I'm gonna because uh, I did weigh in a little bit on the on on the, the kids not respecting uh, someone until they saw respect to them. That's not the way the world works. Um, I have found over the years that if you treat someone from the respect from the very beginning, they can be the biggest hard ass in the world, and <laughs> they melt. Um, and what we need, though, because of where this environment of where our youth has gotten that they feel that they have to go out and make, you know, they have to receive the respect first, is we need some leaders that show them the way. Um, John McCain was, and we dedicated the book to John McCain. Uh, Celinda allowed me to dedicate the book to John McCain. Um, and you know, he was someone that saw the worst in humanity and I think because of that was such a civil person. And for all the talk about how bad things are in politics, uh, one of the things that I think impressed the nation at the time was when uh, he was doing a town meeting and someone made a very derogatory comment about Obama. Uh, and he stopped the conversation, walked over to that person and said, you're wrong. That is not who he is. He's a good father. He's a good American. And people were surprised at that, but that was the John McCain I knew. And that was the John McCain, I, I was lucky enough to run his convention in 2008. Um, that was the John McCain that really uh, turned me strongly towards the, uh, the, the positive. And we need other leaders that will do that with our youth in the future. I think Ed said it well. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, Celinda and Ed. That was wonderful, really inspiring. And I think we're all gonna walk away with a lot of uh, ideas and how to rethink our conversations with people that we, we really disagree with. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. Let's go over them super quickly if uh, we have the time. Uh, so this one's uh, really interesting from Jacob. What are your thoughts on lawn signs? Uh, law and signs during election season and their role in respectful political discourse. Have you or the people you've spoken with noticed an uptick in your signs with mocking or negative messaging in the past few election cycles? Well, I have really noticed an uptick. Uh, first of all, I think lawn signs are great and I think it's a great way to show community support and, um, I obviously believe in you know, our own signs because I have two on my lawn right now. <laughs> one supporting the post office and one supporting uh, statehood for the district. Um, but I think that, um, you know, uh, I, I think that it's more bumper stickers than yard signs, but I just don't think there's any need to have curse words and that kind of stuff in. And I curse all the time, which is not good. And, uh, Ed is, is much better than I am. I'm much saltier mouth than he is, but I just don't see where that's necessary. And I, I think, you know, it, it's your neighbors. It's your, kids are walking by that. What kind of example are we showing? Um, so I'm a huge believer in yard signs, but I, I don't see why you can't express your opinion. Actually, I have three yard signs. I have one defend Montana too, because that's where I'm from originally. Um, so I, I see no reason why you can't express your opinion and do it respectfully. And I, I, I think we should, obviously we're, we have free speech. We believe in it very strongly, uh, but I just don't think that's necessary. And I think I, I like the kind of candidates who would say, please take that. I don't want that kind of yard sign used in my in campaign against my opponent. I guess I haven't noticed as much the yard signs with other comments besides the name in the office. Um, uh, but I've always kind of watched yard signs with an interest because 
uh, you always have someone who goes and tears the opponent's yard signs down, thinking they're going to make a difference in the election. Um, and, and that has always happened out there. I think, unfortunately, um, the discussions where people will talk about uh, stealing votes or vote suppression on both sides, um, I've not seen that being done by the campaigns specifically and certainly not by institutions. Um, but I do see it happen from time to time on both ends, both the vote suppression and the, the vote cheating. But it's the people doing it are individuals much like those that used to go and tear the yard signs down, thinking they were making a difference in the, in the elections. It doesn't happen enough to make a difference in the elections. It shouldn't happen. And I think we need to jump on it when it does happen. But um, I think this whole discussion we've had in recent years about the, the security of the vote and stolen elections is not good for democracy. Um, and it is uh, certainly a, a lot of people off to the whole system. I mean, one of the things, if you look at, uh, going back to the primary problem that I mentioned, um, you know, we in a presidential election year um, in 2020 uh, hit a high of 68% of eligible voters voting in the general election. And less than half of those voters voted in the primaries leading up to picking the nominees. That's the bigger focus we have to focus on. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the little games people play on the side um, is not helping at all getting there. Thank you so much. I think we can squeeze in one final question before we wrap things up. Uh, so this is from Megan. Uh, how do I have a productive conversation with someone who has a completely different set of goals than me? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I wonder actually um, if they do have a completely different set of goals. Um, and I, I, you know, if since we both converted parties, or at least I'll speak for myself, since I moved from a Republican Party, um, you know, I did, um, and I remember my dad being very okay. upset about it and saying to my mother, I don't mind that she's a Democrat. I just wish she weren't a communist. And for the record, I am not a communist. Um, so, but I really wonder how many fundamentally different goals there are. I really wonder if there can't be common ground. Aren't there oh, things there that all of us want? We may disagree about how to get there, um, but I doubt that we have fundamentally different goals. Who wants dirty water? Who wants this planet to burn up? Who wants children to go home to bed hungry? Um, and a lot of people that may disagree about the role of government are actively involved in charities and things like that to fulfill those goals. So I'm wondering, um, I bet there are some issues where the goals are quite different, but I wonder if there aren't uh, other issues where the goals are not that different. And then I wonder in some cases if these decisions shouldn't just be left up to uh, the individual. Um, and not not be a, a, a comprehensive um, decision, but I I would challenge the assumption that there's no common ground. I would it may be hard to find common ground because of lack of respect, and I definitely can appreciate that. But I wonder if we can't find common ground. Anything to add, Ed? Oh, oh, he's gone. Mm. Well, Marianne, he may come Ooh. back. <laughs> yeah. He say, uh, you are wonderful. Oprah, Ooh. if yeah. you're on, would be in danger here. You are a wonderful moderator. And oh, thank, thank you so, so much, Linda. <laughs> uh, for your thoughtful comments and your mm. great interviewing style and what a great audience. Mm -hmm. And would love to continue the dialogue. So please, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need um, to hear what Ed had to say at the end. <laughs> yes, yes, All right. Well, thank you so much, Celinda. Uh, thank you to Ed also for joining us. I and also thank you.
Yeah, thank you so much to our audience for coming in and sending us your questions. I hope you enjoyed the program today. And uh, yeah, we do have lots of other programs coming up here at Connecticut Soul Statehouse. Do check out our Facebook page, our website. We do have our farmer's market uh, tomorrow. If you are in the Hartford area, we have our farmer's market from 10 a.m. to 12. Uh, it's rain or shine. So uh, do come down and support your local farmers. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a wonderful start of your summer. So Linda, thank you again uh, for joining us. And uh, I'll say goodbye to Ed as well later on. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Oh, there is Ed. I don't know why it keeps. <laughs> I had my 14 year old get off mm. playing. Mm. <laughs> oh no. So I thought that would help. Okay. Well, that we were just wrapping up. So. Just saying our final goodbyes. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can continue the discussion later. And again, really thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.